ask you to understand what God has will, what God has planned. I only know at His right hand stands one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word and deed. Christ died to save me, this I read. And in my heart I find a need of Him to be my Savior. That He would leave His place on high and come for sinful men to die. Morning, everybody. I, I know things seem a little strange to you this morning, but uh, bear with me. I'm getting my bearings this morning, a uh, little bit on the disoriented side. Uh, Josh is using my desk and, and office area at home for his interview this morning because that's where he's been taping all of his uh uh, interview tapes and things down there. So the live interview is going on there. So I moved to the office this morning to uh, to tape from the church. And so instead of having my big screen, I got my small screen. So everything has to be <coughs> adjusted and reordered. And uh, it is just good to be with everybody this morning. Let's see who all is aboard, if I can figure out how to move everything now, because everything is instead of being right-handed, is left-handed in my brain anyway. Uh, Sherry's there. Donna, good morning. Uh, Julia, buddy, uh, God bless you. Uh, Carolyn is on board, and others, as they come on, just go ahead and pop in, and we'll give you a high five and a hi to everybody, and we'll uh, kind of get ourselves started out. Uh, so the setting is a little bit different this morning. The backdrop is a little different. The lighting is a little bit different, but uh, uh, we are all here. And uh, Terry, good morning. And <clears throat> all around us, every once in a while you may hear uh, some background noise, uh, voices. Well, of course, we have a schoolroom uh, next to the office there, and uh, they're upstairs and they're in an opening kind of thing, and things are going on. And they're being very respectful and trying to uh, uh, to watch their volume levels and stuff during the time that we tape. They're great, great, wonderful group of kids and teachers and uh, uh, just a real blessing to see them and, and hear the laughter and the, the joy uh, that comes there. You know, uh, with everything going on, when you watch a child, it's an amazing thing because life is just life. And uh, I praise God they have the ability to feel that freedom and uh, not be uh, oppressed by the things that are happening around them, uh, the kind of things that they'll be experiencing, uh, certainly as they get older. Uh, we're going to move. We, we wrapped up yesterday our study in Joshua. Monday we're going to start in, in Judges, but uh, uh, we've got these two sessions kind of as a bridge between the two. And as we've studied through Hebrews and, and now Joshua, there's really a clear sub-theme that we have mentioned a number of times that's consistent through all. And that is the absolute necessity of pressing forward and moving on to maturity. Of course, we saw that same sub-theme in Philippians when we studied through Philippians on Sunday morning. And this is what Paul is saying, I forget what lays behind, but I, I press forward to the, to, the, to the mark, to the prize, to the upward calling of God. Uh, in essence, the Great Commission uh, for us is uh, not just to go out and evangelize, not to go out into the world. The, uh, the, the imperative of the Great Commission is to make disciples. Uh, as we go out into the world, as we are traveling, as we're going about our daily life, we are to make disciples of all ethnos, of all people groups. Uh, and so making disciples is a, a core part of who we are as growing believers. And if we're going to grow to maturity, it has to become a part of, of our life. A few lessons back, 
I pointed out the necessity of passing on to the next generation what we've learned of Christ in this generation. Uh, Paul tells young Timothy in his second letter, uh, which, by the way, uh, many of you know, is Paul's last letter that he wrote, and uh, probably uh, some of the last words he wrote we ought to take notice of. But he says to young Timothy uh, there in, uh, there we go, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, here's really the uh, uh, the the emphasis, the title, if you will, uh, for the next two sessions: a growing uh, a growing disciple, uh, and we're going to break that into two parts, uh, so that we uh, we don't overextend ourselves, but we uh, we give time to what is uh, is necessary. So one of the last things that Paul shares with uh, his younger protege is the necessity of discipling others that would in turn disciple others who would in turn disciple others who would in turn, you know, on down the line to you and me. In other words, passing on to the next generation these truths, these principles, and this lifestyle that we call being a Christian. The word disciple comes from the Greek word that we get the word multiplication from. So it, it might seem like a strange way to interpret disciple, but a disciple was one who, who under the tutelage mentorship of, of a, uh, uh, a teacher, a rabbi, uh, a philosopher, whoever, but would uh, then pass on, if you would, their life. They would be multiplying their life and teaching in the life of their younger disciples, their, their protégés, their uh, uh, their disciples, and uh, they would in turn then multiply that life into the life of those that they mentored and those they discipled. So it is a process of multiplication. We are literally, Christ is multiplying his life in us that we might in turn, as Paul did, multiply the life of Christ in him into the lives of others. That's why he could say, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me. You know, so you know, he's not saying, I'm Christ. He says, but as you see Christ living his life through me, imitate that, live that. Uh, good morning, Pam and uh, Terry, uh, as you are on board with us. As we move into Judges, we will see what dangers exist when we fail to pass on to the next generation what God has done. It leads to great peril, danger, and tremendous heartache. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them. Well, I know you do because you don't come to Bible study without them, and you've got your journals there, which you're really going to be using the next two days. But in Judges uh, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it says the people served the Lord all the days of, of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work the Lord had done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. You remember this is back there in Joshua 24. They just brought it over and it's almost, it's these same words. And they buried him in the territory of inheritance, inheritance at Timna uh, Harris and in the hill country of Ephraim, uh, north of the mountain Gash. Uh, and, and all the generation also were gathered with their fathers. That's all great and wonderful news, isn't it? But there is bad news at the very end in, chat, in verse 8. He says, And there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord, nor yet walk, uh, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. You really need to underline those words because they're important. Uh, they're important to understand what we're going to be looking at when we get to Josh, uh, Judges. The problem in Judges is simply this. There's a whole generation that rose up and they did not know the Lord. And they did not know the work that God had done for Israel. Well, why didn't they? Why didn't they know this stuff? Well, it's because that those who knew failed to pass on to those who did not know. Now, here's the peril. 
they failed to continue to grow and mature. Uh, and if we are content to simply uh, soak it all in and sit on the sidelines, we will surely sour in our walk and devotion to God. We will, if we fail to pass on what we have learned, what God has done for us, if we fail to disciple others who will disciple others, then there will come a time, there will come a generation who does not know the Lord or the work that he has done for them. This is why what we're talking about now is so vitally, vitally important. Let's pray. Father, with great joy, we can come together in, in this study and, and just simply lay ourselves before you, the supreme majesty of all of the universe. You are God of gods, you are Lord of lords, you are King of kings. And Lord, we come and humble our heart before you and with great joy and praise upon our lips, we thank you for this day, a day that you have provided for us. You've created especially for us today that, Lord, we might enjoy you, that we might revel in you, that we might serve you, that we might be the people of God called into this world. Thank you, Lord. And I ask you that you will speak to us through your word and that you will encourage us and you will excite our hearts, Lord, with a revelation of what you want to teach us today. Show us, Lord, who we are, where we are, how we are, and where you're taking us. To you be glory, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we move forward in this, some years ago, Sherry and I were involved in a renewal movement that uh, developed through uh, and from uh, a discipleship process uh, created within the SBC called Master Life. Many of you have heard of it. Maybe some of you are even familiar with it. Dr. Avery Willis, who was a, uh, a tremendous fellow, uh, loved him like a father. Uh, he was our mentor, uh, discipled us in this process. He developed this process on the mission field in Indonesia, where he served as president of the seminary. Uh, and very instrumental and a part of the great Indonesian revival that took place in the late 60s and early 70s. He was asked uh, to bring this process to America and launch a discipleship movement, which he did. Uh, and we were involved from the very early development uh, process uh, uh, and, and became workshop facilitators and co-leaders uh, doing workshops all over, over the United States, as well as helping to develop it within the, the churches that we served at the time. When Master Builder, uh, uh, a sequel to Master Life was developed, Avery asked me to help develop the workshop model, which I did. In fact, 30 years ago when we came here, one of the things that, one of the, I, I was on the field a short time and then I, I flew down to the seminary in California to lead a master builder workshop down there uh, that had already been scheduled before uh, we ever came up here to preach in view of a call or that the church had ever called us. And for uh, some years while the workshop process was still in, in the making, Sherry and I were still going all over the country leading uh, workshops in both Master Life and Master Builder. The process of Master Builder, that study course, is built on the, the model of what is called the Master Builder presentation, which is simply a visual that helps people understand the developmental process for not only the disciple, but the mentor or disciple maker. Uh, through that visual, one can determine where they are in their spiritual development and uh, in their own ministry of discipleship. Remember, we cannot get away from the call of the Great Commission. If you are a believer, you, that, that Great Commission, that call is yours for life, that you are to make disciples 
of all ethnos. In other words, wherever you are, you are in the process of making disciples. It's an intentional thing. It's not something we just accidentally fall into and uh, we just gotta you know, go along and automatically become uh, disciple makers. No, it's an intentional thing. There is an intentionality about disciple making that we have to take very seriously. And this presentation, this, uh, this model gives us a visual to help us understand exactly where we are in that process. Since the goal of, of any study is not only to learn more, uh, but to be able to apply what we're learning uh, by doing, I think it's important at this juncture to look very seriously at uh, our own spiritual development and how God is working in our life and see how he has brought us along and the people that have helped <coughs> excuse me, to get us there. To that end, uh, I think it'll be both a, a personal and I believe a, a helpful journey for the next two days for all of us. Over the next two days, we're going to take time to overview not only the life of the disciple, and we're going to be that disciple and determine where we are, but also for the life of the disciple maker, the disciple, the mentor. And we will see where we are in that process as well. So we're going to be looking at ourselves and others a, with, with, with an eye in both areas. And we're going to use the master builder as a... Uh, uh, a process to do that. So in your journal or on a separate piece of paper, I would like you to uh, to make a, uh, uh, well, a, a, a diagram like this. It's a rectangular, uh, you know, uh, drawing, and it's divided into five sections. Uh, you can see how I've done it there. And there is a uh, a squiggly line, two of them that go from the uh, the lower corner to the upper corner, and uh, that that is the path, if you will. That's the path, the the journey that the disciple uh, is on, and where where we are in in growing in that path of becoming mature in what God desires us to be. Now you'll notice it's not just a straight line from the corner to corner. It's squiggly, it's up and down, because our walk with God is rarely, oh, I didn't mean to click that up there, is rarely ever uh, a straight line. Uh, we all know that uh, it's uh, our life has ups and downs. Uh, at the top of the page, write God, because God is the one who is in the process of developing. And it says, Paul says that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I plant, Paul, well, Paulus plants, I water, but it is God who gives the increase. So we always have to make sure that God is in the right position within our life, that he is superintendent and sovereign over everything. And then in the bottom, just as the, you, you can put the word master builder at the bottom because, you know, God is the master builder and we are workmen within that process. Uh, so if you've got that, uh, this drawing represents the journey the disciple makes on the pathway to maturity. But it also represents the roles and the tasks of those who take responsibility to help the disciple to grow. Uh, you could relate this to several scenarios within Scripture. For example, Barnabas discipled Paul, did he not? It was, Bar well, first of all, Ananias was instrumental in, in beginning the process with Paul. And from Ananias, uh, we learned that, uh, uh, you know, certain things happen as we studied that. But ultimately, uh, he comes back and, and Barnabas comes alongside him. And we know from what the scripture says that uh, he and Barnabas labored together there in Antioch. And when they went out, it's referred to as Barnabas and Saul and Barnabas and Saul because Barnabas really was the, the, the older, more mature. He'd, he'd been there. But uh, so he is, is teaching Saul the ropes, if you will. He becomes his mentor for a period of time. And then we find that the break comes between Barnabas and Saul. And then, you, then you're going to find it, it, it's Paul and Silas or Paul and Timothy or Paul and, and Luke. And, and so you have, you have you know, 
Paul and others that he's discipling and bringing along. And we also learn that Barnabas goes on and he takes under his wing John Mark who Paul could not do much with. In fact, he, he's the one that the, the division became because uh, Paul didn't want anything to do. John Mark was a, a crybaby, a, a mama's boy, and, and you know Paul said, enough. But Barnabas took him later in Paul's life. He says in his life, bring John Mark with you, for he has, he has great value to me. He's used to me. So Barnabas mentored him, discipled him. Uh, and Paul went on to disciple uh, Timothy and uh, and uh, Titus and Silas and you know so many others uh, that we we find in Scripture. Uh, so when you get there, you you understand now what we're talking about. Well, stage one for the disciple uh, on that pathway is that of an unbeliever. So if you would go ahead and I'm hoping that you can see this. I don't know how large, you know, this all comes across to you when, uh, uh, let's see, we'll try and do it this way. And, uh, you know, so you get a better picture of this, but, uh, you know, uh, the, it, it is that of an unbeliever. That's the first stage uh, on this path that begins for the life. Remember, you know, Paul was, uh, uh, when he was struck down on the Damascus Road, and, uh, you know, he was sent away blind, it was Ananias that came to him, and the scales fell off his eyes as Ananias prayed for him. But you see, Paul began this journey for himself as an unbeliever, as we all do. You see, uh, as the unbeliever, so you write unbeliever there uh, on the bottom. Uh, at the top, write the word disciple, discipler, uh, and role. The discipler's role. And at the top, at the bottom, just put the word tasks. All right? Uh, well, the role that the discipler, the, you know, the discipler is the person that you will see, that's our activity, uh, and all everything that we relate to is outside the box. Everything that uh, relates to the unbeliever is there on the path, or the disciple is there on the path. So the discipler's role here uh, is that of a witness. Uh, and uh, his emphasis is always going to be on the cross. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, and you can write that in that column as well, says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So as a witness, what we are doing, we are we're sharing with them the, the, the power and the wonder of the sacrifice, the love of Jesus Christ. And in Colossians 2, uh, let's see, uh, let me move on here. <clears throat> and Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, uh, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, you know, we have this responsibility. You know, we have this, uh, this role of being a witness to those who do not know Christ. Uh, in Acts and verse 1-8, uh, you all know this verse very well. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So the task of the discipler at this stage is that of evangelism. So if you want to write evangelism and uh, at the bottom of that lower section, that's your task. Your role is to be a witness. The task that goes along with that role is that of evangelism. And as Paul told young Timothy, he said, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. 
So the witness, as he goes about the task of reaching the unbeliever, as you and I, as the, as, as the, the witness, the disciple, go about that task of witnessing uh, to the unbeliever with the gospel, we go through a number of steps in order to communicate the message of grace to the unbeliever. We go through the stage of contact. And then we cultivate that contact, build that relationship, that bridge. Remember, though, always keeping in mind that the goal is to build a bridge that they can cross over to Christ. And uh, building the bridge is not the end itself. The end is that we might come to the point where we could communicate the gospel with them. And after having communicated the gospel, sometimes multiple times, sometimes other people aiding in that, many times others aiding in that, communicating the gospel to that person, they finally come, or prayerfully, they will finally come to that point of commitment where they surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, likewise, the unbeliever goes through uh, a series of changes as well along the way uh, from uh, a doubter and a skeptic and, and someone that doesn't want to hear. They're brought along, their appetite is whetted, they, uh, they, they seek more, they begin to learn more as God begins to draw them to themselves until ultimately they come to that point of surrender and giving themselves up to Christ as Lord and as Savior. And once he or she makes that step of surrender, they enter in to stage two of what it is to be a, a disciple. And that is the, uh, the stage of being a spiritual babe. So if you would, in the second column, write spiritual babe on that path. Once they make that commitment to the Lordship of Christ, once they come and they surrender to him, then they're no longer an unbeliever. They are now a spiritual babe. Uh, so as you look at that, the role of the discipler to the disciple is that now of a parent, okay? And their task is that of follow-up. You know, this is where I think many times we drop the ball as uh, believers, as churches, is we'll see somebody saved and then uh, we pat them on the back and then we just let them go about their own way without sufficient parenting. It would be like the person who uh, gives birth to a child and leaves it on the doorsteps of a fire department or a police department or a hospital and walks off. And they do that repeatedly over and over again. And when they're finally caught and they're, they're, they, they say, why do you do that? So, well, my job ends when I give birth. It's somebody else's job to raise them. We'd call that person either nuts, crazy, or a criminal, wouldn't we? But the problem is we do that all too often in Christian circles. We will lead somebody to the point that they, they give their heart and life to Christ, and then there's no sufficient follow-up, no parenting of that person, no nurturing of that individual as uh, they, they begin this new spiritual life. Uh, they need to be taught. They need to learn. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, he says, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. You see, the problem comes when we uh, don't move out of spiritual infancy, and many people fail to move out of spiritual infancy simply because they're not properly parented, if you will, spiritually speaking. Uh, when we don't move out of spiritual infancy and continue to grow, we end up where Paul uh, comes to when he writes to the church in Corinth in the third chapter of that first letter. He says, brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, as mature, grown-up men in God, but as to men of the flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you are still fleshly. You're still living like before you were ever saved. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not carnal? Are you not fleshly? Are you not walking as mere men? For when uh, one says, I'm of Paul, another, I'm of Apollos, you are not mere men, 
Or are you not mere men? In other words, you're not growing. Now, I think we all know people who have been saved for a number of years, but they're no more mature than they were the day that they were saved. Now, they may have seniority, they may have longevity, but they don't have maturity. Uh, you know, when we see a baby uh, uh, acting up, when I look at my uh, great-granddaughter and she's got that scowl and she's throwing a little tantrum, you know, I look at it and think that's pretty cute now. But when she gets to be uh, older, uh, I used to chuckle at, uh, you know, Josh, you know, I used to chuckle at that. But I got to tell you, when they get older or they get to be in their teenage years or young adults and they're still throwing those kind of tantrums, it's not so cute, is it? And we've all seen it. And we see people who have been Christians for a number of years, but they have not matured or grown beyond spiritual infancy. Uh, in this stage of spiritual infancy, the emphasis for the mentor, the discipler, is to nurture them, to feed them, to help them along as they learn to reorder the priorities of their life. Uh, you know, just uh, just like a, an infant, Avery used to talk about discipleship uh, through f through the preaching. He said it's kind of like going into a nursery with a with a hose that's connected to a milk truck and uh, and just spraying the nursery down. The babies that get their mouth open, they have their mouth open, get something, but the rest just simply get wet. And that's kind of the way it is. If there's not an intentional uh, desire to parent, to disciple these brand new infant Christians. Uh, and you see, just like a baby, a, a spiritual a baby, a spiritual infant begins by crawling. Uh, they begin by doing the, you know, little things and, and learning little things. But as they, they crawl pretty soon, they're able to stand and they wobble and, uh, and they, they fall down and they get up and they wobble and they fall down. Pretty soon they're taking a step or two steps. These are all necessary steps and stages within the life of the infant, the spiritual infant, but it is our job as the spiritual parent to help them along. In this stage, seeds are being planted that have germinated and are beginning to sprout. Foundations are being laid and the beginning of this new life, this new building is starting to shape, take shape. And uh, the spiritual infant moves from crawling to their beginning steps in the Christian life. Uh, what we need to bear in mind when working with spiritual infants is that uh, very much like working with physical infants, sometimes they need attention at inopportune moments. Sometimes they need to be fed outside the normal meal times. But as a loving parent, uh, we take the responsibility to nurture and care for them until they're able to stand on their own and even begin to feed themselves. Uh, you know, going back and thinking of, uh, of uh, Riley, uh, there was that point not very long ago where everything she got in her mouth, she got because her mom and her dad spoon fed her and uh, made sure that she got the right kind of nourishment, the right kind of food. Uh, it wasn't long before she was starting to reach for the spoon and uh, going to do it herself and she'd get it all over her face and just make a horrible mess. But as time goes on, those motor skills and those uh, uh, fine skills will be honed and pretty soon she uh, begins to hit her mouth more than her forehead. And uh, she'd be able to pick things up now and put them in her mouth. She can hold the spoon and, and, and that just improves as they go along. <clears throat> well, of course, we're talking about a physical baby, but it's no different in the life of a spiritual infant. Uh, though they may have an inkling of the cost of following Christ, when they surrender to his lordship, their understanding begins to grow. And now they come to a desire to, to know more, to learn more, to, to, to grow more. And they make this commitment uh, to become uh, a functioning, if you will, disciple. Now, they've been a disciple from the time they were saved, 
but they really have not understood until they come to this point that, that there's, there's this responsibility that they have to begin to grow. So we enter into stage three, and stage three in the life of the disciple is when they make their commitment to, uh, to enter into becoming a spiritual disciple. So they're on the path in the third column there, just right, spiritual disciple because they've made that determination. They've made a decision. And it may have been prompted because you've said, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to, to, to have Bible study with you, or I'd like to, to uh, teach you some things. I want, I want to help you to grow, whatever. There is an intentionality on your part that leads them into making an intentional decision to be a, a, a follower of Christ, to be uh, a follower in the sense of being a functioning disciple. Now, the role of the discipler here to the spiritual disciple is that of a servant. So write servant at the top of that column because now uh, you are, are really taking on the, the, the role of servanthood with them. And the bottom uh, uh, of that, your task is to train them. Now you're doing more now than just simply uh, feeding them and, and making sure that the right diet is put before them. Now you're going to help train them in how to, to function and, and uh, work and live as a growing disciple disciple. So the emphasis of the discipler is on cultivating these people, watering them and, and, and cultivating and showing them how to weed the, the weeds out of their own field, if you will, and how to prune what needs to be pruned and, and how to shape the building that is being shaped. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul goes on to say, you know, in that verse, in those verses 5 and 6, what then is Apollos? Uh, what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. We cannot cause the growth, but we can cultivate the field. You can make the environment conducive to growth by creating the right situation for growth. Surrounding the disciple with growth opportunities, if you will. In Colossians 2 and verses 6 and 7, <clears throat> excuse me, go back there. It says uh, there's these, these three pictures that we get. Therefore, as you have received Christ uh, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and being uh, built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were instruct, uh, instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So you see the growing and building uh, discipling process here. We are stewards of growth to those that we are helping to grow in the faith. As Luke says, uh, just as they handed down to us those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and servants of the word. You see, these eyewitnesses and servants, Paul and others, Luke is talking about because he was so closely associated with Paul, they handed these things down to us. They taught us. They made the environment right for us to learn that we would grow in that respective relationship. You are appointed a minister, a steward, a witness to assist the growth of those who are on that path. Paul, when he is sharing his testimony, says in Acts 26 and verses 6 through 18, he says, get up and stand on your feet. Wow, that's what God said to him. For this purpose I have appointed, I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also the things which I will appear to you, rescue you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness and to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. In this stage, the disciple grows in his walk with God and begins to show signs of maturity. The building of his life is taking shape and the trees are beginning to show fruit and the believer is beginning to look more like a mature and grown individual. As the mentor, the discipler, your goal is to lead them to the point where they make a commitment to go on to leadership. 
where they will begin to replicate uh, in, in the lives of others the qualities that they have put into practice in their own life. We're going to stop here from now, and we're going to finish tomorrow. Uh, for today, though, I would like you to examine the stages that we've looked at so far. Unbeliever, spiritual babe, spiritual disciple. Do you see yourself on the path and, 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 and how that growth is going? There's two other stages to go, and you may be there. Do you recognize where you are in the journey? Begin to identify individuals that you know and place them somewhere on the path. Are they still yet unbelievers? Or are they spiritual babes? They may have been Christians for a long time, but are they yet still spiritual babes? Are they spiritual disciples that are intentionally growing and learning and developing? Begin to ask God what he's showing you through this process. And begin to identify ways that you are seeing how this presentation relates to our study in Hebrews and in Joshua. It's a lot to take a bite of, but you got today and uh, into tonight to mold these things over as we come back tomorrow and finish the next two stages. Well, with that in mind, uh, I think we've come to a point where we are going to wrap up, and uh, I'm going to close that up so I'm not squeezed in the corner now, and move that right up there, and I'm going to pray for you. Father, what a joy it is to, to just spend time sharing your word with such a wonderful group of people. Lord, I don't know how many there are out there or how many will plug in, but you do. And you know the word that you have for each and every one. And Lord, I simply ask you according to your word that this word that goes out would not return unto you without accomplishing its purpose in each of our lives. Father, bless us as we go on through this day, keeping us mindful of where we are as disciples and our responsibility to make disciples, to mentor others. And Lord, let us make those firm commitments as long as we draw a breath to fulfill that great commission that you've given us to make disciples. We love you, Father, with all of our heart. And now, Lord, I commit to you all of these through this study that you may do in each of our lives what you choose to do. You are sovereign, and we are your servants, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's been a blessing. And I pray for you today, and I'll continue to pray for you through the day. May God bless you and keep you. May his word abide in power within you. God bless.